And we're recording. Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Frathis. I'm the publisher of Sublunary Editions. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about uh, our latest release, The Posthumous Works of Thomas Poloster by Eric Cheviard, translated by Chris Clark, who is our esteemed guest. Um, we did this a couple of weeks later. Um, so for those of you who attend a lot of these, let me know if you, you like that better, because I, I thought it would be a nice chance for folks to get a chance to read the book before we talked about it. Um, so yeah, let's let's go into conversation um, about what is really a remarkable little book. It's a book that is uh, a sort of nesting doll of Eric Cheviard's uh, consciousness, his writerly personas. Uh, it it is a book that um, lends itself to multiple readings as you are going through and picking up on subtext. Um, and overall, it's just a fun book. Uh, it's exactly what we come to expect from uh, from Eric Cheviard. Um, you may know some of his other works in English. I have a few of them over here. Uh, most recently, I believe, has been Palafox, translated uh, by Wyatt Mason. He's had a couple of books translated by Jordan Stump, including Demolishing Nassard, as well as Crab Nebula, which he did with Eleanor Harden, uh, and Allison Waters, who is on the call. Hi, Allison. Uh, did Prehistoric Times for Archipelago um, some time ago. Chris, uh, joining us here in the top left of my screen anyway, is a scholar and literary translator currently based in Philadelphia. Uh, he has published several translations of Raymond Cano's work over the past decade, uh, including a uh, rather hefty addendum to New Direction's expanded anniversary edition of uh, Exercises in Style that came out in 2013. Uh, book length translations. He's also done uh, Patrick Modiano as well as Marcel Schwab's um, Imaginary Lives, which I believe won the French American Foundation Translation Prize in 2019. And he is currently, I believe, putting the finishing touches on uh, another Quino, The uh, Skin of Dreams, I believe, which is out via New York Review of Books sometime next year. And we'll be working on a collection with Sublunary again next year which we'll talk about towards the end of things, uh, a collection of Julio Cortazar's short writings uh, paired with the artwork of Julio Silva. Whew. Chris, how you doing? I'm doing all right, thanks. <laughs> I, I would have turned that Cano manuscript over to my readers today if I wasn't doing this, so it goes in tomorrow. Uh, um, thank you um, for progressing <laughs> here with us today. <laughs> It's good. It's, uh, it's been quite a project. Um, 50 pages of exercises is one thing, but a full, a full length canoe novel is, uh, is an undertaking that should not be paid by the word. <laughs> what, what would be a fair rate pay, paid by the agonizing um, hour or? No, it's, it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to do it. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, and he's, he's not the only uh, challenging writer you've taken on, uh, which let's get right into our, our uh, imagined guest of honor for tonight. Um, this book had its genesis uh, nearly a decade ago, right? It did, actually. Um, I guess around the late 2000s, I was reading a lot of uh, Edition du Minuit, and tried my hand at some Christian Gailly. I read some, I uh, worked on some Tanguy Viel. And uh, a colleague of mine recommended that I try this Cheviard in particular, um, having heard that that Cheviard talks about it as the one book that he'd love to see the, translated the most. So I took it for a spin and it became my master's project in my translation pro uh, program at NYU, where my magnificent workshop leader, Allison Waters, was just putting the finishing touch on her translation of Prehistoric Times. So it was really good uh, timing to be able to talk about that. In fact, uh, now that you've read this, you'll recognize that the cave that Pilaster's wife dies in is in fact the cave that Allison so remarkably describes for 150 pages. Um, so I had to go back through hers and make sure there was nothing that needed to be in mine as far as word matches. But um, So yeah, I translated it that year and I finished it and defended it as my master's project at the, in the fall of 2012 and then tried to sell it. It's a tough book to sell. Um, if you've had a look at the shape of it, 
The problem is that, first of all, um, publishers like to read brief samples. What, what would you show them from this that would convey the way this book works? Secondly, um, that same problem that we run into as translators when translating writing that's done in an intentionally difficult or ponderous way sometimes is when you hand that over, they just assume it's a bad translation. <laughs> um, so when you run into these yard long sentences of, of Marc-Antoine Marçon, who is clearly trying to outright pilaster in his introductions and we end up with these sentences with 13, 14, 15 commas and normally in English we parse that down. But uh, since that's part of the story, that has to go in and you show that to a publisher and they take one look at it and say, well, this guy's got some, got to do some more practice and then we'll look at his work again. So I tried a few publishers back then and, uh, and it didn't go anywhere and I revised it again and went through the uh, helpful notes that I got from, uh, from Allison and from Richard Seaberth. Revised it again, and then went on and translated five, six, seven other books and did a PhD. And waited until I found a publisher who was already a fan of Cheviard and who was willing to read the whole book, which, thank you very much. The, uh, the description of uh, showing a publisher a sample of a work like that, I, I feel like that's, a, that's the kind of thing I gravitate towards. I, I see both uh, Jessica, who did the Osvaldo Lamborghini, and Matthew, who's working on the uh, Works of Kleist right now. So it's it seems to be kind of my thing um, <laughs> to to go after works like this. We we had a funny uh, actually. Uh, P.T. Smith is on um, back towards God. This it, I, my sense of time. I'm sure you all sympathize is a little warped uh, after this last year, but I think it was right after. Um, uh, you know, culture migrated online that uh, P.T. Smith and I were talking uh, about books to read. Like we, he posted a picture of his uh, haven't read yet shelf, said, does anyone see anything on there? They also haven't read and I hadn't read Palafox, but I happen to have it on hand. And during that conversation, Chris, uh, at least unless this was a grand scheme, unbeknownst that I had started a publishing venture, spoke up and said he had a, a manuscript um, I remember you tweeting very clearly. I wish someone would translate some more Cheviard. And I said, Hey, um, do you mind if I email you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that, that, that is a funny bit of serendipity that, that led to this book. Um, I had read it excerpted in music and literature. Uh, edition eight was um, primarily focused on, on Cheviard's work. Um, part of the diaries were excerpted in that edition. Um, and as you said, there, yeah, it, it just seems, it doesn't make sense the way it just, there's no introduction. The footnotes are out of context. Um, it seems like it doesn't work on its own, you know, I mean, there, there's some lovely phrasing and some interesting ideas in the prose. And that's really the, the interesting game is does Pilaster's writing stand on its own? Is he worthy of this attention and adulation? Um, and that really ends up being up to the reader to determine that because of the way that it's positioned in the book. It's if you read certain lines uh, out of context, say if you if you took the uh, first section of the diary and read something like, whatever becomes of all those very pretty little girls, ruled out hypothesis, these teenage girls, you would think, ah, oh, that's, I mean, it's not even really that that funny until it's not until you get the interplay with the editor, with the footnotes, with the prefaces that it all starts to come together. Um, you could very well say like, oh, this isn't Cheviard's best until you start thinking through the mind of of Marsong and until you start thinking, why is this person choosing these writings and uh, making these cuts um, and, and really the story unfolds so much in the prefaces and the footnotes. Um, not, not that the other pieces aren't enjoyable by themselves, but I think you would, if you just gave me the pieces and nothing else, it, it's, it's not the same. It's not, it's not as strong. It's not as interesting. It, it's not the same, but I would caution you to focus too much on what Marcel says as well. Um, yes. And that's how, 
um, I, I wrote to Chevard about this for a while when I was finishing it up. Um, I was introduced to him years back, but didn't end up writing him until I was doing these last revisions. Um, do you want to hear a snippet from one of the emails he sent me that kind of explains the way he looks at the book? Yes. I just translated this very poorly before dinner. So um, he says that what he likes best about the book is that the pact with the reader is redefined. The reader has to form his own opinion as to the quality of Pilaster's texts and the appropriateness of Masson's uh, remarks. He does not know what the author, or in this case, Cheviot himself thinks of the texts. And he says that the responses he got from the book amused him a great deal. Uh, certain devout readers didn't know if it was appropriate for them to appreciate or enjoy this text or that text, or whether they should make fun of it. Uh, certain articles or reviews even cited the same passages, but one chiming in that it was fine literary craftsmanship and the other declaring it to be nothing but comical pastiche. Uh, for Cheviard, Pilaster and Marceau are the two faces of a single author, and together they form the author of a book that exists only thanks to the violence of their opposition, the struggle between satisfaction and vanity on one hand and insatisfaction or shame on the other, that is the, uh, the mind of every writer. Um, so, in fact, I ended up asking Cheviard if he would write a third blurb for this book, uh, not commenting on the book itself, but on Pilaster's writing. And that's kind of where this exchange took place, because he said, well, I like the idea, but I will not. Um, because he said um, that he didn't want to interfere with the reader's need to decide for themselves whether Pilaster's writing is any good, whether all of Marcel's comments simply come from envy or personal dislike. Um, so he said, yeah, they, uh, the two of them represent his own writer's bipolarity and together are a self-portrait. Um, so he decided to remove his authority from the equation to force the reader to make up his own mind about both writers. So. That I think is some good insight into, and and yeah, like like you're saying, Josh. The first time you read it, you tend to buy what Marcel is saying as, and that's I think one of the points of the book. We read these footnotes, we read these insightful paratexts, and we think, well, this guy clearly knows what this is all about. He knows the other novels that he's read all of them, and we haven't. So he knows a lot more about the author. We have to take his word for it. Um, but then you read through some of the passages, some of the little exercises, and some of them are quite good. Um, how good? I won't tell you because that's up to you guys, I guess. The the interplay, um, e even Pilaster after death is, is still getting in his own retorts in, in some places. Um, it was, I think, maybe the second time through that I noticed a uh, footnote it's in the first um, first diary section, the bottom of page 40, uh, where the diary entry says, I hear myself with such shame praising, there's an ellipses, for his dreadful poems, wonderful compliments that would embarrass Rimbaud, whereas I would be disgusted to wipe myself with this paper he had already put to such poor use. Where did the duties of friendship end and where does my cowardly accommodating nature begin? And the footnote around the omitted name simply says a legible name on the manuscript. And when that there clicks, are, there, there are a number of those in there that you assume is Marcel. There's a, a botched suicide attempt that is clearly him. There's a lot of comments about short, fat, bald men. That's clearly him and so on. So he's in the text that he's commenting on himself and he does his best to remove those traces but uh can't do them all together <laughs> um why don't you um maybe read the beginning the uh, preface to so many seahorses which is one of the uh sections included in the book i think that's a good um sampling of marcelin's treatment of Pilaster's texts yeah um yeah i thought i'd read that preface because it's pretty short and kind of gives you a taste of marcelin's tone as well as a, 
a little bit of what Pilaster is about. Um, we had toyed with the idea of the seahorse for the cover too, um, in the shape of a question mark, um, until I realized that that was the cover to my Jean Painlevé DVD box set. So that was my <laughs> only objection. Otherwise, I would have voted for that one. So, so many seahorses. Note. In 1967, Thomas Pilaster published under the title So Many Seahorses, a collection of analogical formulas with poetic pretensions, which likely testified less to any veritable renewal or to a desire to open up his little literary undertakings to other forms of writing than to the fact that his novelistic practices had run out of steam. After the award-winning success of The Smile of the Dead, 1964, in fact, Pilaster seems to have gone into one of those periods of fallowness that he would know all too often over the course of his life. Too often, in fact, for us to be permitted to refer to them as crises, rather reserving this for those short periods of fertility, or at least of productivity, during which he penned his slender volumes. We would have to wait until 1976 to read his next novel, The Disappointing Carollo. During those 12 years, he wrote not but a few short stories and this collection, So Many Seahorses, from which we have assembled here under the same heading, the scraps, the dross, the rubbish, all that he gave up on including in it. The majority of these formulas are, all in all, simple metaphorical definitions of classical construction, relying on analogy or association of ideas, such as anyone could amuse themselves in writing. It is an enjoyable exercise. Here is how one proceeds. Let us consider, for example, the giraffe. First, we notice his very long and stiff neck leaning forward at an angle. We know, additionally, that he willingly feeds himself on leaves that he tears from the highest of branches. The whole, then, can conjure up a ladder that has been rested against the trunk, a tree trunk by a gourmand. And so it is a matter of gathering these tidbits of information into a short phrase in order to obtain something like this. This is how we may recognize the giraffe. He is the one who remains on the ground to support the feet of the ladder atop of which he is perched, safely chewing tender leaves. We could easily accumulate examples using this model or others of which the paint by number format can't help but remind us of the waffle maker. You just pour in the batter. It's foolproof. Pilaster was particularly fond of these innocent games of the quill, and here he appends a footnote to his own introduction. Lees, on the other hand, didn't hold them in much esteem, judging them to be beneath him. And yet, for each one of these formulas, you reward me with a smile, Pilaster replied to her. We were familiar with Lisa's smiles. Her mocking smile was the most radiant of smiles. Her heartbroken smile, the gentlest of smiles. He continues, which in truth demand less talent than they do know how, even if a lazy literary dexterity may not always be quite enough. We urge the reader to try some, there's no harm in it. To begin, choose an object or animal that is su sufficiently distinctive of which the appearance in and of itself already strange and incongruous arouses the imagination, calls for comparisons. The lobster, the beaver, the swordfish are excellent subjects for a beginner. Equally good, the use of a bestiary, often expanded to include the vegetable kingdom, is another regular occurrence with this sort of aphorism of which, let us be frank, enough to admit it, uh, frank enough to admit it, pardon me, the philosophical reach is non-existent and the poetic elan is equally stunted. So Many Seahorses unquestionably remains Pilaster's best book. We were only acquainted with the truncated version from 1967. Here with these unpublished pages is the complete text finally restored. Uh, shall I read a few of the seahorses themselves just to show? By all means. <clears throat> the question mark made flesh, equipped with fins that are butterfly wings and a prehensile tail, the seahorse asks nothing but deep questions. Why whales? Why the crayfish? Why seaweed in the madrepore and the coral and the rocks? 
And why no tritons or mermaids? Why did life evolve from out of the waters? Why all this water? How? So many seahorses. The fish is the opposite of the harpoon. In this way, they complete each other. Projectile body, round mouth with crimped lips, the supple barb of a kiss. From the front, the horse is a carp like any other. We believe the cat a fool for chasing his tail until the day he catches up to the goldfish in his bowl. When the ferret will have finally found it, oh, and find it he will, what will become of him? Just what will become of him? The lion is the sun that casts the shadows of the tall grass and makes them dance on the coat of certain white horses. There is no other zebra. A sword swallowing snake, nothing surprising about that. This is why he's a fire breather. It is easy to distinguish the python from the boa. When the first swallows a camel and the second a dromedary, the latter has two humps and the former only one. In the beginning, birds crawled on the ground like everyone else. Then, an excusable misunderstanding, one of them sat on an acorn among his eggs and the entire nest suddenly found itself perched, to which Marson appends a footnote that reads, this misunderstanding is Pilaster's doing very obviously, a feigned misunderstanding on which all of these formulas are based. The little analogical games presuppose less intuition than they do bad faith. With that in mind, there is nothing to stop us from claiming that their taste is like that of turtle soup and pineapple juice. The canary hasn't touched the whites of his egg. If anyone is looking for uh, a sort of key to this particular section, might I recommend uh, Ramon Gomez de la Serna's aphorisms, which I was in a panic sending uh, examples of the similarities uh, between these two to both Chris and members of the sublunary team uh, before this. And as it turns out, Chevy Yard has written about them uh, specifically. So would highly recommend if you enjoyed those seahorses, De La Serna. Um, so there were, in addition to the two voices that you're, um, you're dealing with between Marcelin and, and Pilaster, um, there are a lot of styles within the book, both the short pithy diary entries, these aphoristic um, um, aphorisms, uh, as well as the haikus that, that appear uh, towards the end of the book. Um, what was I, translating Cheviardian haikus into English? Uh, what was that like? It was fun. That was the part of the, the book that took the longest for the, the least amount of pages anyways. Um, I was in a pretty Olympian headspace when I was working on this book. And so I followed a very perhaps unnecessary constraint. Um, one of the catches is that Pilaster never manages to hit the appropriate syllables for a natural haiku other than one time, which he marks beside that one in pencil in the manuscript with an exclamation point because he's excited that he's pulled it off finally. Um, the other problem is he can't stop himself from rhyming. So if you've ever tried to translate a haiku with a syllable count of four, two, one, and two of them rhyme, it gets pretty difficult. Um, but other than one, maybe two, there was, there was one for sure and maybe a second, I did maintain the syllable count and the rhymes. So 
there were there was one in particular that I discussed with Cheviard and just to make sure to get the image and to get the image that he explained to me, I couldn't maintain that. Um, and that's the other, maybe one of the other difficulties of this book when it comes to either the, the aphorisms or the haikus is, I don't know if any of you ever read uh, Eric's blog, but I think some of that's being translated right now and some of it already has. Um, but often it ends up being a question of translating images instead of words, because the words don't necessarily make the image work. Um, in particular, there was one about a tree uprooting itself. And until you visualize that the roots of a tree are the opposite of the top of a tree, you don't see this uh, this image develop and the words don't really spell it out for you. Um, Cause I think that's what Cheviar does with a lot of these is he, look he looks at things for a long time and and they kind of pronounce what's particular and what's interesting about them um, but without having it in front of you you don't necessarily always get that from the words and then you end up searching for it until you picture it and then you can write it so that someone else might be able to picture it how is the process of um translating really sort of two different writers in one did you end up uh doing the whole text um you know as treating it as a single text did you do um Marcel's bits and Pilaster's bits separately and and how did you sort of develop their distinct though very often bleeding together voices mm, I think I think the first time through I did it front to back and this was one of the first books that I did a full length project. Um, and when I did revisions in later stages, I did go back and just work on Marcel or work on short pilaster texts or work on his prose. Um, there's a limited amount of, of straight prose in this. There's a, what Marcel calls a failed attempt at detective fiction. And there's the cover story, the uh, three attempts at the reintroduction of the maddening tiger into our countrysides. Um, and then there's the unperformable play. And then most of the rest of it are snippets. So those, um, I didn't work on the two diaries together. There's the early diaries and the late diaries. I wanted to see if there was any difference in the tone of them. Um, I don't think so, though. It seems that, at least according to Marcel, that Pilaster has gone back and edited that first diary anyways to remove anything that wasn't up to his standards years later. Um, I think the hardest prose in the book is is clearly Marcel's because he's trying to put in a showing. He's trying to uh, show fans of Pilaster that maybe he was the overlooked writer who was in a way, the genesis of some of Pilaster's better works, but never reaped some of the benefits. So he's trying to to really pile together some long, chewy literary sentences. And uh, uh, the tigers and the uh, and the detective fiction, they have their clumsy moments, they have their pretty moments, but uh, neither of them are are quite so uh, complex as as Marcel's bits. And you have the off off screen, the, the better received novels of, of Pilaster that we don't get a look at. Um, mm. It's yeah, the the layers of that. The just hearing you describe that uh, Marcel is editing this diary that um, Pilaster himself edited after the younger version of himself, um, and all this. And the, the later diary is what was cut out of the published later diaries. Uh, much like the uh, the seahorses are what Pilaster himself expurgated from the book he did publish. So, um, so with that again makes us wonder if these are of secondary quality, if they weren't up to the standard of what might have been in these other books. And then we wonder about, is a great writer always great? Uh, or could Pilaster be a truly great writer? And Marcel here is presenting materials that uh, should have stayed on the cutting room floor. And certainly there's no shortage of real world uh, analogs to, to this situation in, in literature. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we'll name names. Um, so it's something I, I wanted to save it for a little bit later, uh, but something you said earlier um, about Chevy Yard's design for this book of leaving it up to the reader to judge uh, the quality of Pilaster's prose, um, whether or not to take it seriously, whether to laugh or whether to consider it stylish. I think we pretty much nailed a continuation of that with the blurbage. <laughs> Uh, I don't. Everyone who, who doesn't have uh, have this, we have our. Um, we we did. We opted to stay in the spirit of the work, so the blurbs are actually referring to the works of Pilaster, not Cheviard, uh, as as the author of the book. Um, we have one from Daniel Levin Becker, um, who wrote many subtle channels in praise of potential literature, um, and then the who's, other who's also currently translating Cheviard. So yes. Not to... For you. Um, be on the lookout for that. It's a collection of short stories, right? Yes, I'm excited about that. Uh, and our other blurb comes from a Joseph Maldonado passage, uh, who you all may know as Joe Exotic. And I think so. Let me let me set the scene for you <laughs> that I get an email from Chris one day. Uh, we had only. Um, talked via email I believe until that point and he sent me an email that says hey are you free for a call or a video chat there's been a tiger related development uh Chris you want to take it away well at, at this point we'd already Josh had already decided on the tiger cover and this is kind of a recurring joke throughout the book that Mason keeps bringing up the project that the writer has that he talks about for years but you never actually finally see it this was uh, Pilaster's Tigers. He went through several years where he'd, you know, be invited to a party and then say, oh, I'm, I, I can't, I've got to head home and work on my Tigers. Um, but no one ever saw this. And of course, when Marson is going through his papers years later, um, what they, they find is this short story stapled between a series of rejection slips. Um, so I don't even really know how it came about. This happened in late June, early July. So peak of the pandemic when we'd all been sitting at home. Remember when it was just going to last three weeks and we just sat there and sat there and sat there. And so at that point, we're at three going on four months and we're all getting a little stir crazy and we're all a little bored. And so on a whim, I'd seen the cover, I'd seen the tigers and I thought, you know, who'd write a good blurb for that? the Tiger King. So I wrote a letter to Joe Exotic at Fort Worth Penitentiary. I found the address online um, because he was circulating or his, or his lawyer on his behalf, perhaps um, write to Joe and then sign the petition for him to be released from prison. So there was the address. I sent him a letter on a whim. I was com- just bored and I thought that not only he'd never receive it, but that he'd certainly never reply to it. Well, there we are in the beginning of September, the last days of August, and I get in the mail this postmarked, um, sorry, can you see that there? There we go, postmarked Fort Worth, FMC Fort Worth. Um, so what I had done was I had sent him, you know, a very polite letter explaining uh, I, I sweet talked him. Basically, I said, "Mr. Maldonado Passage, um, you know, you're you're a television sensation. You're a country music star. Uh, you're very well known in the animal kingdom. The one place you haven't made your mark yet is literature. Well, I have a solution for that. And so I sent him. I printed out a copy of the Tiger Story, and I sent it to Joe." and asked him if he'd read it and give me his opinions. And and if he had anything interesting to say, I could maybe use it as a blurb or convince my publisher that we could use it as a blurb. And so he wrote me back this charming long letter on the back of my story. Um, You know, Chris, hey, thank you for your support. Kiss your wife and know I send my love to you both. You can edit or reword this any way you want. 
Love you both, Joe Exotic. So there we go, Joe Exotic, the Tiger King. In the letter, he basically explains his breeding plan for ligers and to ligers and the ligers and how he was re inventing the genetic code for these animals so that they could be, as Pilaster's narrator suggests, be re-released into the wild and, um, and allow man to reconnect to his primal nature. Um, so <laughs> that's basically that. That's the story. Uh, I pulled a few lines from the back. And the, the humor of it that led me to then write to Levin Becker and suggest that he blurb not Cheviard, but Pilaster is, of course, I didn't bother to mention to Joe Exotic that this is an imaginary author's book. Um, so he comments right in his letter, Thomas is spot on. So Thomas Pilaster and Joe are in full agreement as to uh, the nature of the tiger's role in man's existence. So it was just one of those random ideas that uh, somehow came to fruition before uh, before we had to have the book in. So Josh was a little skeptical at first. It, it took some convincing. Um, I, I, I do not condone the reasons for which he is in, in prison currently, uh, but it, it is absolutely in the spirit of, of the book. Um, I, I love that we did this with, with blurbs, which are... Um, you know, I, I already have a love-hate relationship with him as a publisher. Oh, exactly. Um, the, the blurb is kind of a, a silly medium to begin with, so why not bend it to the... And, and I mean, this is half of the fun with discovering a Cheviard book, too, is quite often the first-time reader of a Cheviard doesn't know really what's going on. Um, when I first... When I read my first in translation, anyways, it was Demolishing Nizar, and I was certain, having read Pilaster in French, that Nizar was also an invention of Cheviard's, uh, but it turns out he's not. Um, Cheviard does spend 180 pages railing on a long dead French author. Um, so he's already within his body of work playing with these expectations. And again, this is a, a very sublunary thing. I think a lot of people actually thought Osvaldo Lamborghini was a figment of Cesar Ira's imagination. St I'm still not 100%, but um, I have different agents, at least. He invented by Bolaño? <laughs> um, for, uh, for closing us off here, and then we'll, we'll maybe uh, take some questions from, from other folks. Uh, maybe I'm looking at page 96, uh, the third section um, of, of the Tigers. You want to spoil the ending of the Tigers? Oh, the <laughs> epilogue is really the, with the uh, yes, true. autopsy, maybe just to the end of 97. All right. So part three of three attempts at the reintroduction of the man-eating tiger into our countryside. Three, the tigers were released. That night, Lesser opened wide the gate of the pen and the 19 tigers vanished into the wild, 14 females and five males, upon which his plan for the repopulation of our countryside rested. 19 magnificent beasts, heavy with musculature, a burden made lighter thanks to the strength these muscles provide, with electrifying coats and with powerful claws inside their muffs of soft fur. How calloused in, compar in comparison is the hand of the peasant who grips his pitchfork. And with jaws that will not loosen their grip strong enough to hold at the platform a train crammed with the fleeing, for it is panic rather than fatigue that overcomes us when the tiger's teeth are unexpectedly bared in an uninfectious yawn. The effects of the usual contagions are confounded. But after all, no system can withstand the introduction of a tiger, whatever that system's nature. However well-oiled it might be or armored in rust, we will quickly observe serious malfunctions. Our political system, as well as our economic, scientific, philosophical, religious, and educational systems 
and also our precious little personal systems, be they organic, nervous, or digestive, are immediately short-circuited or thrown into a panic and fall apart as soon as a tiger appears. Afterwards, everything must be taken up anew, reinvented. This is Albert Lesser's great hope and the secret ambition of his entire undertaking. Uh, footnote reads, Pilaster's faithful and even remarkably opinionated readers will smile when they recognize in this naive admission the argument of nearly all of the writer's tales. 20 years after Bapst, he has made a small scale model of the same worn out fable, the lesson of which has never in any way managed to turn the order of things upside down. Perhaps the sole significance of the, pre the present variation is this implicit statement regarding the failure of the body of work that it continues to regurgitate, a failure that in this way is also its own. We continue. Consequently, this morning, he's eager to know the first effects of his experiment. Nothing reaches him, however, no news at all, no tolling of the bells and the hours go by, no sign of emotion or alarm in the areas surrounding the village. The reason for this is both simple and unnerving. After having ventured into the unknown night, a night filled with the moon and cries of fright, the 19 tigers returned home to their stable and huddled up against each other, trembling among the scents of the previous night. And the great beasts, overfed, growl with satisfaction to see their, their master approach. They rub against his legs and roll over onto their backs, begging to be stroked. But Lesser unceremoniously gathers this miserable streak together in the pen and pushes it outside. Then he once again shuts the gate. Second attempt. The next day and the days that follow, things in the area indeed change. I'll stop there. Thank you, Chris. Um, in addition to this, which is available now in fine bookstores everywhere and on our website, um, Chris is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, working on wrapping up Skin of Dreams by Raymond Cano, which is going to be out from NYRB next year. And uh, Chris, we've got another little project coming up um, later this year uh, or early next year. Next, next month for me, next month. Um, yes. Two short books bound together. I think you're going to do them as one. Um, the first written by Julio Cortazar in French uh, and illustrated by Julio Silva. And the second, paintings by Julio Silva, then described uh, in Spanish by Cortazar. So, uh, Le Discours de Pince Gueule, which I'm so far calling what the mugwig has to say, and then Silvalandia, which is the, uh, it's, I mean, Silva was born to draw Cronopios and Famas, and this is in that same vein, but it's a mysterious little kingdom full of colorful, blotchy animals. So, uh, as, and described, uh, their adventures described as only, only Cortazar could do. So those will be out in uh, January of next year. We'll uh, we won't spoil any more. There's there's uh, like with Cheviar, there's good stories behind the genesis of of that text as well. Um, any questions before we wrap up from from the audience, uh, folks who either have or, or haven't read the book? Um, anything you'd like to like to hear talked about? Mm -hmm. Can we unmute ourselves? Is that okay? <laughs> yes, by all means. Hi, Allison. Hi. Hi, Josh. Hi. Hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, that was great. Thanks. As you were reading, of course, I was laughing so hard I was crying, but with the seahorse, I mean, I love it. 